everyone. Welcome to the show. My guest today is Courtney Reardon. Courtney raises capital for a boutique asset manager, and she is the 68th U.S. woman to summit Mount Everest. She's also my sister. Courtney, thank you for coming on. Thanks for having me. Now, you've been climbing for a long time, and, and it's something that's been really important to you. You've, you've done it in really a lot of places throughout the world, and, and I'm curious what drives that? What, and so what, but what I want to know specifically is what in life are you ambitious for and what in life are you greedy for? Okay. Um, well, the, the first thing that I have to answer your first part, like what drives that? Mm -hmm. And I think if you're lucky enough to come across something that comes to you naturally and easily, you want to keep doing it because you're like, this seems easier for me than it does for those around me. And that feels like a, a natural boost. Mm -hmm. um, so I think maybe that's partially an unsatisfactory answer because it's like, I like to do it because I'm good at it. Or like, it feels not as hard for me as it does for other people. Um, but that's, that's kind of the true answer. Um, and then what am I ambitious for? Oh, I guess like, I mean, it feels so, you feel so like liberated and free when you do it because you sort of like slice out, you sort of like, like excise this like moment in your life from like all the other things that are kind of going on. And you're oftentimes like unreachable. Um, you have no like cell phone service, no internet service. Um, the only people to like interact with or talk to are the people like in your immediate climbing group, which tends to be, you know, pretty small or kind of like like-minded people in a certain way. Um, and, um, does it feel well, like, I, I used to envision you hiking or climbing somewhere and it'd be like seven years in Tibet, you know, where you're Brad Pitt walking around and it's just, there are these huge vistas and it's, just something about that. I'm, I'm sort of joking about it, but I, it's actually a serious thing. Something about that is special. Is yeah, it, was that I, the case yeah, for you? Yeah, you, the, the big vistas is very accurate. Um, and you sort of feel like, wow, dude, like I can't believe this exists on this planet. Like, I, and, and like, yeah, you're in, it's awe. I guess I'm in awe a lot of the time. And I'm like, I can't believe this exists on this planet. And like, how lucky am I to get to see this like moment in time and like all my, all these things in my life lined up to allow me to experience this like incredible thing. Does it, does uh, everything so, yeah, feel, it's awe. I think I'm in awe. Oh, that's interesting. Does, does everything feel a little bit zoomed out where, where you're, where it's almost like you're, you feel like you're on a planet because you, you don't feel I like that most of the still time. Zoomed in. Okay. Um, most of the time when you're climbing, at least most of the time when I'm climbing, I'm very much paying attention to, yes, my surroundings, but also like my, where I'm placing my feet. I, can I feel my hands? Like, oh, and then every once in a while, my mind, like you're doing it for so many hours that like your mind just kind of like unhooks from like the the routine and you mm -hmm. start your mind kind of like wanders in a different direction. And it's maybe that's what I don't meditate, but maybe that's what people that meditate experience like that mind wandering. And I can't, I'm not even trying to control it. It just sort of like goes off into different tangents and you sort of sort some, you sort stuff out on your own. It's interesting because on an everyday basis, most of us are running errands, doing work, getting things done and you're always looking at what's right in front of you. And so it really, it, it isn't something that lends itself to reflection at all. It's, it's the opposite. It's engagement. And so you, you find that when you're out there, it, for you, is there a reflect, is that your, your reflection yes. going out? Very and reflective time. Yes. Very and, much and so. And what do you, what do you feel when you're, you know, I used to go on these hikes in LA and it, it, it sounds stupid, but it meant the world to me. I would go up into the, the Santa Monica mountains by myself and I would 
go go hike on the loneliest trail I could find. And there were some that were not even on the maps or anything, and no one would be there. I wouldn't see any person for two hours. And I don't think anyone would be within, you know, I don't know, several thousand yards of me. And it, and I would just stop and sit and just look at it. And I just, I, I loved it. I just felt, I, I was able to sort of step back outside myself and feel that I was alive and experiencing this. And I loved that. There, there was something, I don't know, spiritual and almost religious about that. And it, it meant a lot to me. Yeah, it's very, very similar to that, I think. Um, and then there's also this component of, like, we, we live in such a materialistic world that to drop all those things and have them matter not is so nice, too. Um everything you have has like a practical purpose. Mm -hmm. Um, and that it's sort of, it's like a minimalism in like a really very, um, like practical way, because if I, if I'm bringing it, I have to carry it. Um, and oftentimes I'm not as big as like, you know, maybe some of like the, the like big guys that climb. So I have to like be really conscious of it. So I like the little, like, I like the detail in the planning of like, I'm going to, it's like a little strategy of like, I'm going to like take as little as I need and be fine. Like for example, on one climb, um, everybody else brought these like meals you pour water into and it's like, Oh, now it takes, it's pasta and pasta sauce. And it's like a dehydrated meal. I'm like, no, I'm going to take like pepperoni and cheese and like, <laughs> mango slices like nothing hot you know just because i wanted to like see if like in a cold environment for like three or four days like would this be okay with me and i i was like these are the these are the foods like i would never eat at sea level because they're not good for you but i was like i'm it's like a, a break from like all those like restrictions we put on our day-to-day -day life for me and i know it sounds like i'm putting myself in a restrictive environment but it feels liberating like like mentally liberating um in terms of liberated from like my objects, liberated from obligations. Um, my mind is like free to go in whatever direction it needs. There's not, there's very, there's, there are moments when you really have to pay attention to what you're doing, but there are a lot, there's a lot more time where you, your mind needs to be occupied and it's your responsibility to do so. Is there a part of you that would like to just live in a climb? Not, not a really arduous one, but just live in a climb and just be in there. And you'd have, you'd have Pete there, your son, and you'd have Doug. Doug would come and go. Like Doug, Doug could people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not, yeah. But just live in that state. Um, maybe in theory, but part of what I like about it, like part of the, like part of the joy that I get is that it's not my every day. Okay. Um, I, so I, I, we may talk about this, but I was going to India a bunch, like maybe 10, probably more than 10 years ago at this point. Um, and in that way I was living, um, I was living like, like a semi nomadic lifestyle and I, I liked it very much. Um, but, and I, I fantasized about doing it forever while I was doing it. Um, but part of the joy is like, you know, having these like two sides that are kind of in conflict um, to, to my, you know, life and character and personality and sort of getting to express them both. Um, like, I think, I, I think I've told you this before, but when I got back from, um, Everest and landed back in New York city and like, you know, got to my apartment, showered, changed, and like got into my city clothes. Um, and, you know, I'm wearing like a leather jacket and like, I look like, like a city at, basically like tough, like fashionable city. It. And I'm right. sitting on the subway and I'm just like looking around and I'm like, these people have no idea what I just <laughs> did. And like, I just got so much joy from that. Like it's just my little, like my, this little secret um, until I did Everest, only my very close friends really knew I was even into it. Cause I kind of kept it like on the low down. And so it was like this little like secret side of me that like, only, only like some people were privy to. And I kind of, I kind of like that. Oh, that's interesting. So is there, I, I'm curious, is there something in life that you're greedy for? Cause you're not, you're not greedy for money. You're not greedy for 
clothes or popularity? What is there something that you that you're really into? Um, freedom, probably. Uh, I mean, I could see I that. Really... I, I could definitely yeah. see that. <laughs> um. I feel like at a very, like, very young age, I was given a lot of freedom. So Scott and I are one of, we're, there are four children in our family. Scott's the oldest and I'm the third. Mm-hmm. Um, and we have a sister, we have, you know, a brother between us and then a sister who's like seven and a half years younger than me. So I ended up getting probably more freedom than most kids my age because, you know, you got the two mischievous older boys right. and then like, later on when I'm like seven or eight, when you sort of want to venture out and kind of have your own independence, my parents have a baby to take care of. Um, And so I feel like I got a lot of independence and um, autonomy and freedom at a young age. And I, um, I, I, I really, it was like a gift. I really enjoyed that. Um, And even, and so the greedy for the freedom, but like earning, having a good income has afforded me that freedom. Like I was really proud of the fact that I like paid for Everest myself. Mm -hmm. Um, And I went to Antarctica, which is a very expensive trip. And I paid for that myself. And that was really like empowering to me that like, I can just be like, I want to go. Like, I want to do it. And like, I'm qualified. Like I can pay for it. Like no, nobody, I had to check with, you know, nobody, even my husband, like, you know, he wasn't like, he was like, he was kind of like, why are you asking me? He was like, of course, like, do what you want to do. Right. Um, and, uh, and, and, and like, I'm like, oh, the, the Antarctica trip was very expensive. And I'm like, oh, shit. and it's not as like tactile as like Everest in terms of like, this will affect my self-worth and life, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I remember like hemming and hawing with him about like, should I spend the money on it? And he was sort of like, only you can make this decision and i love that you know like you two are both only very I can make that decision. you two are both very independent people yeah <laughs> and you, as you've explained to me the marriage is a venn diagram two two very very strong individuals who want what they want and then it <laughs> then it overlaps. it overlaps yeah and actually you know what's funny as we've like over the years we've been together i think like almost 12 years and we've, we're overlapping more and more and more, which is really nice because you would hope it would go in that direction. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Um, but I'm sure there will be times in our life like where we're less overlapped. And, you know, it's sort of like a fungible thing. Um, so, but, but him being that way affords me a lot of the opportunities too. You know? but, but let's say you got that freedom, right? Let's say you were you earned the money you always you wanted to earn. You had what you needed. You don't not, you don't need to work anymore. What comes, I'm, I, that's something I ask myself because I'm obsessed with freedom as well. You know, what is it, once you have that freedom, what do you want? You know, for me, what I'm, what I'm greedy for is I, I want some adventure. I, I just feel like regular life is, is so much of regular life is, is just dull. And I want something yeah. where, where, where it's, you push the boundaries a little bit or you take some risks and you just, you do something interesting and just some adventure comes of it, whether it's in work or in play and I, I like to reflect on things and then it gives you something to reflect on is is that yeah. are, are you adventure focused are you connection with people focused um at different times in my life different things have been a focus I really leaned into that adventure aspect for you know from like probably age like 25 to 35 Mm -hmm. um like deeply leaned into that um like I spent you know from my vacation days at work during that that 10-year period I think like all my time was all my vacation days were spent in a tent um maybe except for our wedding actually our honeymoon was in a tent too I forgot about that um but so I really feel like I not like I'm done with the adventure but like I'm not hungry for that right now in my life I know it's, I think I've described to you like climbing is sort of like this, it's like this beach ball that I have to like hold underwater for a period of time. And like, Mm -hmm. there gets to a point where I'm like, oh, I just don't have the endurance. It's going to pop up and I need to satisfy it again. It's not popping up for me right now. Um, I'm very focused on, well, 
I don't know if this is too much, but like I was really reluctant to leave that adventure chapter um, and start a family. Oh, and I remember, Courtney. Be, yeah. Oh <laughs> my God, I remember. <laughs> You weren't sure you weren't sure you wanted to have kids. The whole thing, Lindsay and I, my wife, used to joke that, you know, and Courtney here was very conflicted about having children, thought her life would be over, which it is when that when you do have kids, uh, your life isn't a very a certain part of your life is over, but very concerned. And Lindsay and I were thinking about this, we were laying in bed discussing this and and when Courtney was pregnant, we were like she all that is going to flip. And she's going to become this psychotic mother, this psychotically <laughs> devoted mother, and just be utterly in love with her kid and just inundating us, just flooding us with with everything he does, pictures and stories. And that is exactly what happened. Exactly what happened. And I, here's the theme. I'm not very good at moderation. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, there's not. There's no moderation <laughs> what, whatsoever. So I'm kind of in that, I'm kind of like, it blew my mind how much fun it's been. Like it's, it's, um, it, it's totally different than what I expected. Like, you know, people like people, I guess people like complain about having kids and I, I, they're, they're more like letting off steam, but I took them very literally. Mm. Um, so my expectations were very low and it's just blown my mind as to like how fun it is. Like, you know, it's challenging and like it tests your patience and all of these things. And, and that in itself is kind of like, I mean, uh, the climbing, like, you know, living in a tent for like two months, that'll test your patience, you know? So I, yeah. I kind of like putting myself in these situations where they're like micro miseries <laughs> um, and, and like not letting my, not letting myself think that way. Um, and so like, you know, it, uh, yeah, I'm very much like enjoying this little, like my little buddy who I, and now I still like, I put him in the backpack and like go hiking with him. And now he's 30 pounds. So he's like a good rock weight. So he, it's a good, you know, workout to my, <laughs> <laughs> my, my aspirations elsewhere. So I'm curious. So where did you start? You started really climbing a lot when you went to India frequently, right? Yeah, I had done a Knowles course and that kind of got me interested in like winter camping. And then like, I enjoyed that. And I didn't know anybody else who was into climbing or even like really into the outdoors. So I had to sign up for these like organized guided trips. Mm -hmm. um, and if you want to do something in the winter and you're not like an excellent skier, um, the, the like group trips are like mountaineering stuff. So I did um, like a an intro mountaineering course in Alaska and then I had this um, like two week gap between jobs um, and I randomly like went onto the Knowles website and saw that they were doing a trip to India um, and like within a week, like got my visa, asked if I could delay my start date by a week and, and um, kindly enough, my new manager agreed and, um, and I went and I met my friend there who's, uh, who's a mountaineering instructor for them. Um, and he invited me to come and climb with him in India, or um, he teaches a course in um, in the U.S. as well. Um, and so that sort of um, like opened the door to that more like like an unstructured kind of learning, like you know, outdoor skills. Okay. That was like that was mostly rock climbing, though. Not a, there was some mountaineering, but it was mostly rock climbing and like camping. It was the hardest in terms of the micro misery. I was told I was not miserable. I was like loving it, but it was the hardest living conditions I've ever experienced. Cause you're in um, rural India, you're camping out. Yeah. We're like camping in like a peanut field on the side of a highway. Like, cause we've been driving all night and like, you know, it's not, it's getting like unsafe cause we're getting so tired. So we just like camp out in like a peanut field and. And are there still like, concerns you know. about the water when you're out in rural areas or is it just in the cities? Oh yeah. Oh no. In, in rural areas, just as much as cities. Yeah. So I'm there's... very proud to say I never really got um, that kind of sick in India, which is like a major feat. That is an accomplishment in itself. <laughs> oh, I see. I figured part of the micro mi misery was just the constant diarrhea of being in India. No, constantly, constantly like making sure I could avoid that. 
And then like, you know, not really knowing what kind of food options are going to be and like, you know, moving or traveling for like, you know, 15 hours a day or like not really knowing where we're going, Mm -hmm. you know, like, oh, I know this cool place. We're going here. And I'm like, okay, I don't really know what it's going to look like or be like, or what the accommodations are going to be. And, um, you know, I like not being able to know like when you're next going to be able to shower. Uh, I don't think I was in, I it was in the summer in India and like no air conditioning, which like, you know, that happens, but like the not, not knowing when you're gonna be able to like shower or like wash your hands. Mm. Uh, the washing the hands was tough. Like that's tough. Yeah. Um, or like what the bathroom's going to look like or be clean or like, you know, like, am I going to have privacy? Like things like that. Interesting. But you, but you did that, you did that multiple times and and loved it. Oh, I loved it. I was like living like a dog in like a good way, like, (laughs) like happy companionship activity, like adventure. Um, And if you could just shelve the whole, like all the unknowns of like the lifestyle stuff, like it was awesome. Yeah. Like washed all my clothes by hand, like learned how to do that, Um, you know. And this is something you did for months. Carried all my stuff with me. But I feel like you went there multiple times. You were there for months, if you in aggregate. Yeah, yeah. So, so after doing all that, you formed the decision at, at one point. You climbed Mount McKinley. You climbed De- Denali. They call it now, right? Yeah. That was your first step towards towards climbing Everest. Yeah, it was. This was not Everest. Was never a plan. I never had the plan to climb Everest. I just was sort of like climbing the next thing and the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And it, um, I, Denali was always kind of one of my objectives because I did that intro mountaineering course at Denali. And I remember like looking back at my photos from the trip, like half of them were of like the climbers. Cause I was like, oh my God, these people like walked from here to there and back to here. And like, I was just blown away that they had done that. Uh-huh. Um, And so that was always sort of, that was like the only mountain I've really ever been like, I want to go back and climb that. Um, I'm curious though, with Everest, why do, you're the 68th US woman to summit it. Why are there so few people? Uh, That shocked me. I figured there would have been a couple thousand women. Well, total people that have done it. I mean, I think like the total number of people who have, like in the world who have ever done it is probably somewhere between like three or 4,000. That's so small. Um, that that's nothing. Well, it's um, it's it's expensive. Mm-hmm. It's physically demanding, and it's like mentally, like op- oppressive. Kind of is the way I would say it. Like so unrelenting. How, like so, how much? How much? How much time does it take? Is it, you have to allocate two months? The actual climb is two months. Yeah. Okay. The actual climb is two months. Yeah. Okay. That that's. Um, and I trained, I trained beforehand for three months. Most people train for like a year, but the idea came to me in August of 2017. And by May of 2018, I was on the summit. So it like happened very quickly. I had never, it had never, I had actually previously said I would never climb Everest. So I really now take to heart the concept of like, never say never. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I'm curious. So it's, so you, it, it's two months. That's a long time. You're in, you're in Nepal, right? Um, so I was in Tibet on the China side. Mm-hmm. Most people climb Everest from the Nepal side. I decided to climb it from the China side after talking with um, a couple people who had climbed it from that side. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I can go into that now if you want, or like we can shelve it, but yeah, go ahead. Um, so, so most people climb it from the Nepal side and that's the side with like the Kumbu ice fall that maybe people are familiar with. Um, about a third of people climb it from the North side in Tibet. Um, and the reason it's less popular is because there's no, the Chinese government doesn't allow helicopter rescue. Um, and then, so you'd have to like, get yourself out or like, you know, donkey maybe for like the lower part of the mountain. Mm -hmm. Um, And then the, you're also at altitude 
on the north side for longer. So you're exposed in terms of the um, effects of altitude on your body and the like potentially like cold and wind. Okay. Um, the reason I decided to do it is because I felt like my the greatest risk to people that have injuries or, or death on COVID. I'm sorry, on, on Everest. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get flagged. We're going to get flagged now, Courtney. You can't, you can't do that. You can't laugh about COVID. <laughs> Okay. So the the most like when people I feel like the greatest risk on Everest is um cold exposure which can have a, a cascading effect um and w- like the crowding or like waiting in line to get to the summit or move through a bottleneck was the greatest risk to my personal safety so I decided to go with the like the side that's not crowded even though it had these other, you know, less appealing attributes. It tends to be more experienced climbers that prefer that side. Before you climbed it, what did you hope climbing Everest would give you? Hmm. Um, Well, I don't think I was quite that philosophical about it going into it, Mm -hmm. coming out of it. Maybe I was, but going into it, I was like, I'm going to get like, (sighs) um, I like a, like a long, like, I like a long trip. Um, like, you know, doing like a weekend climb. I'm like, "Mm." but like doing like a three week climb. I'm like, yes. And the longer it goes, the more I enjoy it. Um, So to me, it was like, I'm going to get to be like in the mountains for like living in a tent for like two months. Mm -hmm. Um, And that was the, that was like the main, like, just like, I'm going to be like off the grid for two months. Like that was like what I hope to get out of it. Um, And then, um, I hoped to, I hoped to challenge myself in a way I hadn't experienced before. Did you I didn't know- want it to be just like all the other climbs I had done before. And I assume you knew it would be your hardest climb. Yes, but, um, I had been so strong on my prior climbs that I think like a little, I had a little bit of like hubris going into it at one point. Mm -hmm. Um, I had trained very, I mean, not for very, like for three months, but I trained very, very diligently. And like, I was wearing like a 50 pound weight, weight vest, like walking up a, you know, 30% incline on a treadmill for like four and a half hours was like one of my last training sessions. Mm -hmm. So I felt very strong and I had already had a strong base from my like prior climbs, my, like my Denali climb, for example, my guide said that they felt I was the strongest one on the team, not just like physically in the climbing, but like in terms of my attitude and like helpfulness around camp and stuff. And um, so I sort of had a little, like a, a little, like maybe a little too much confidence going into it. Like, Oh, I'll be like, I got this, you know, like, Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't quite realize how unpredictable the, altitude can be the whole thing with Everest. It's not like the most challenging climb per se. It's the most challenging altitude experience anybody in the world will ever have because it's the highest. Okay. That, okay. That's interesting. So when you were discussing the pain of it earlier, that's, that's the pain of it. It's the altitude sickness. Is it, are you sick for two months? And that, that, that the, you're a little sick for two months. You're kind of like hung over feeling. Okay. Um, what's that like? That's a long time to feel like that. Yeah. You're like, like your arms feel heavy and like everything feels hard, like walking to like the bathroom or like the kit, like the, the like dining like area or like everything moving around camp, like everything feels like hard and you're lethargic all the time in a way that like, 
you know, people talk about like, oh, like when you're pregnant, this is like on a whole nother level than like when you're like, you know, first trimester pregnancy type stuff. This is like, it's just, it's constant and it gets worse. It doesn't necessarily get better. So is everyone you're in moving a bad higher mood? Up the mountain, you know? Is everyone in a bad mood a little bit? Yeah. At some, yeah. At one point, at some point, at one point, everybody's in a bad mood. Um, and that this was like one lesson that I learned, like, you really have to meet people where they are because like if you're yucking it up and like telling jokes and stuff and somebody is like in a miserable state, like they just don't have capacity to be nice to you. <laughs> and this is totally true in regular life too. Like most of the time when we interact with people, it's less about us and more about where they are. Yeah. And it's just so obvious when you're in a situation like Everest that it you it's a, it's a really strong reminder of like, so much of their reaction has to do with where they are coming from than like you rubbing them the wrong way or, you know, saying the wrong thing or whatever. It sounds a little bit like a twilight zone episode where everyone's just, <laughs> you know, waiting for a rock to slam into planet earth or something. And it's gotten really hot and everyone's just miserable and they're just trying to make do. <laughs> yeah. But then you get, then, then it's like, that's like the period when you're like, that's what they call like acclimatizing, which is like an active rest period where you're sort of like, not doing that much and you're just sort of like enduring and then it's like all right you guys are starting to feel a little bit better let's push the boundary a little bit more and like go a little higher on the mountain you know and then and that's exciting to move to move to a different camp is exciting because you're like we're doing it you know so what is base camp like what is what does it feel like what's the energy there okay so again i feel like on the south side in nepal there's like base camp is a destination and like people just hike to base camp. And I'm, I'm guess I have, an, I have this image of it being like a festive environment. Mm -hmm. um, on the North side, it's much more of like a serious, <laughs> so it's like people are a lot more like serious and it's not a destination. You really only go like if you're looking to climb. So it's a very, like the audience is very different. They're not as, you know, they're not as like fun and lively. The Sherpa are having a great time. They're like, they're like the hosts on the mountain. They like, okay. they're like, come join. It's fun. They're, they're yucking up. You hear them like they have like a, a little hangout tent. You hear them yucking it up over in their tent. Like they're having a blast. Meanwhile, we're all like, God. <laughs> um. in, in preparation for this interview, I watched Vertical Limit. The, the okay. movie it came out in 1999 with uh, Christopher O'Donnell and uh, some other people, and it and it has all these people on the mountain, and they're these sort of lovable stoner hippies who are doing their thing, and then and then there's the grizzled veteran who lost his wife on the mountain and several of his toes, and I'm, I'm envisioning base camp kind of like that. Um, it's not as festive, um, <laughs> and like the pe I mean, my team was all like. Austrian ultra marathon runners. So yeah. like, if you can imagine, I'm 5'10". This was like the first time I've been the shortest in the bunch. You know, I was like, um, <laughs> with like, you know, like endurance, giant endurance athletes. Um, and like culturally, Americans are very different. And I assimilated to like German Austrian culture when I was with them. I was the only non-german speaker the only american the only non-german speaker the only woman we were a small group it was me our sherpa support team and guides um our austrian guide and three members which are similar to me like people that pay the guide service and outfitter to be there and they were all austrian and german um so i kind of assimilated to their culture which is a lot more they don't really like talk to strangers as much as Americans do. And they're a lot more like, you know, quiet and contained and focused. Okay. I, I hear Austrians, a lot of Austrians are kind of funny that, they, they, you know, Germans have a reputation as being serious, but the Austrians are supposed to be a little more playful and funny. Like Arnold Schwarzenegger. He's kind of funny. He, you know, yeah, that ne wasn't needles people. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, we're all, we're all still in touch, but they're much, I, I would actually say like the most playful one was a German guy who lived in Switzerland. Um, and he like, for example, he was like, I'm never doing, I'm never climbing again. Like gave away his boots and like was over <laughs> like on the mountain. He's like, we summoned it and he's like, done. <laughs> like, you know? like, 
I was like, just maybe keep him for like a year. You might get the itch again. He's like, I don't want the itch again. Like I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so, um, so yeah, it was a much more like studious environment. Maybe, maybe other, like I did hear there was an American team, um, that came to base camp after us that we never interacted with. Um, but I, maybe they had a much more like camaraderie type environment, but mine was not like that. It's funny. It'd be funny if they looked at you and they thought you were German or Austrian, just had no idea they, they, they thought you were just some emotionless German, but actually there was a lively American in there who had all these yeah. wonderful bubbly thoughts to share, but they never, yeah. they never but found I, 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 I would get like shy kind of, um, I, I, like I said, I assimilated to their culture a lot more and I'd be like shy and quiet and didn't like, I didn't know how to like make conversation and, um, yeah, so how, I, how, I would, I found myself very quiet in that environment. They so, wouldn't know I was bubbly, you know? Okay. So how long does it take from the moment you guys are, are at base camp and you start going up the mountain? How long does it take to go up and then back down? Or just how long does it take to go up? Okay. So like the process, I mean, you fly to, from the U S to Nepal. It took like, we were like in Nepal for like, or in Kathmandu for like five days, maybe like sorting out paperwork, equipment, things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, then we flew from Kathmandu to Lhasa in Tibet and Lhasa is 12,000 feet high. So we needed to spend a couple days there just to like let our bodies adjust to the altitude. Um, then we drove, so maybe we spent like three days there, four days there. Then we drove for five days um, through the Tibetan countryside to Everest base camp. Um, so the Tibetan base camp is 17,000 feet. I, it's funny on the climb, we did this all in meters. I have never done anything in meters in my life, but then when I came back, I had to switch it to feet and now I can't do it in meters anymore. But so 17,000 feet, and you get there and like, you know, like your blood vessels feel like swollen. Your eyes are like, I don't know if you've ever been on a flight where your like eyes feel sore because they're like so swollen. I, I um, have. And it gets worse. The first day you're like, I feel great. Like, what are people talking about? And then it gets worse. Um, and I was really grateful because some of the Sherpa told me that when they got there, like they were like, we felt, we got here before you guys because we felt like crap, like for a mm. couple days too. And I was like, oh. I think maybe they were just saying that, but, um, but it made me feel better. Um, so you're there for like a week, just miserable, um, because of the altitude. 17,000 feet is higher than anything in the lower 48. It's higher than anything in the Rocky mountains. Um, oh, okay. That's good yeah, to know. just for context. Like I think, um, like Colorado has a bunch of like 14,000 feet peaks. Um, Denali, gosh, no, I don't even know. I think Denali summit is like 21,000 feet, but like that you're only at 17,000 feet or higher for when you're climbing Denali for a couple days, like mm -hmm. two days. So we spend a week at, um, like the Tibet base camp, just feeling miserable. Then you go up to, um, I don't, I think maybe we went to like intermittent base camp, which is probably like. 19,000 feet mm -hmm. um, and then came back down to um, to base camp. So that's like another week to do that. Then you spend, you know, a little more time at base camp and then you go up to advanced base camp, which is about 20,000 feet. You hang out there for three days. Right. And then you come back down to base camp and you spend another week at base camp to like recover. Then you go back to advanced base camp. And then you go a little bit higher to camp one and to get to camp one, it's like a thousand foot ice wall. You go up. Um, and that's a big feat. Um, and you get to the top of that and you hang out there for like, you know, one or two nights maybe. And then you come back down to advanced base camp and then back down to base camp. And then we did our summit push, which was, you know, base camp, intermediate camp, advanced base camp, Camp one, camp two, camp three. Now I don't remember if there's a camp four. I don't think so. Camp three, summit, and then all the way down to advanced base camp in the same day. So when you left the first base the camp. The summit push takes like a week. You start at base camp, 
and you spend one night at each of those locations. When you, so when you first, let's go back to, you've done all this stuff, you've gone up, up to advanced base camp, come back down to base camp, and now you're ready to start summiting the mountain. Yeah. That's what's like five go- weeks in. That's five yeah, weeks in. Yeah. You're a ways in. What's going through your head? Oh, I was like, um, you're sort of like hoping for a weather window, but you're sort of hoping it never comes. <laughs> It's like, it's this mixed feeling of like, um, like I'm doing it, but I'm like, not, I'm not, I'm like, I'm excited and I want to get it over with, but I'm also like, uh, I don't want to like go through it. I'm, I'm nervous. I'm very nervous. Okay. And then but what, nobody talked, I, I, or at least I, nobody would, we would never talk to each other about that. This is the nice thing about expedition behavior. You don't like. You keep your you keep your shit together. Like you're miserable, don't tell somebody. They see you're miserable. They are miserable too. Like there's no need to discuss it because you don't want to spread the misery. Um like you're scared. I, I really wouldn't discuss it with somebody that I was scared. We maybe like a light joke. We all know what everybody's thinking. Do you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. there's no need to there's an, it's an, it's a more subtle acknowledgement that we're all kind of on the same page. So what's it like once you get to advanced base camp? Is it, are there people up there? Are there people who live there or are there a lot? Nobody of... lives anywhere on this mountain. Okay. There but there's no, live there for the, the, like, like us, they live there for the season for just those two months a year. Okay. So, but there are people at advanced base camp who are there already and Our aren't Sherpa just climbing. Team. Okay, but there's no one else other than the Sherpa team and other climbers at Advanced Base Camp. Correct. Okay. And so what's it what's it like? Is it is it creepy? Okay. Is it it, it sounds no, just isolated creepy. and forlorn. Yeah, but you're it's a little like climber community. Okay. You know, maybe there are like fifty people, maybe maybe more. Maybe sixty people, seventy. 80, 100? I don't, I don't really know because everybody's in tents. It's hard to see if a tent is occupied or not. Um, so it's like a little tent town. Yeah. Fairly, fairly spread out, though. Like, it's not like I could touch any other tent from where I was. Do people drink alcohol or anything, or is everyone just totally dying? Okay, in? so when we were there, there was a group, like a, a British, a group of British people that were doing, like, some, like, a stunt that was, like, the highest dinner party in the world. I don't know what their thing was, but they were like, right. they like had like That's tuxedos cool. and stuff. <laughs> and, um, they, they, um, they were great. They like bombed into our, like, um, at base camp, they like bombed into our, um, like group tent to like introduce themselves. And they were clearly like wasted. Um, <laughs> and they were so fun and lively. And like, it was, like, you know, the Germans were like, not very, they were like, they, I think they were like put off at first and then like, it didn't really matter. These people did not care if you were put off, you know, they were like, and they were like really chatty and fun. And I just remember them leaving and I was like, oh my God, they're going to be hung over tomorrow. I cannot imagine. Uh, they're going to die. They're, yeah, they're, they're, yeah. they're going to die. These, they, they were lively and they weren't taking it seriously enough and now they're dead. No, but they weren't trying to summit. They were just trying to go to camp one, which is, which is challenging. Um, but, and they were just trying to have dinner there. Like, so they had a much more like fun, light objective. Um, and, and they were, they were great. I love drinkers. Drinkers, they know their limits. Like the girls were in like dresses too. Like they, they were like got dressed up like that because they didn't need to bring all the like climbing stuff, you know? But I love that. I don't they know if just... they were in dresses at the dinner party, but down at base camp, they were like in gowns, you know? But, but this is what I love about drinkers. They don't, they're not trying. They're, they weren't trying to summit the mountain. They were just having their dinner party and just camp one, which is not that much of a feat. That was enough for them. It is think, a big I think, feat, though. I, I think they were underestimating what they had ahead of them, but, you know. That that only adds to their appeal. <laughs> so yeah. so you get up to the advanced base camp, and and at this point, how many days is it to the to the peak? How many days into the climb am I? No. How many days does it take from advanced base camp to... Once I'm ready to go? Yeah. It's about a week. Okay. A week, a week of climbing. Maybe five days to a week. 
Okay. What's what's it like when you look down the mountain as you start to get high? Is it like being on a ski slope where you're just looking down and it's just a straight shot? It's incredible looking down. I, some of my favorite pictures, like all my favorite pictures are the ones that I or my teammates took looking down because it's so much steeper than any ski slope or any mountain I've ever been on. Like, uh, and you can actually, the cool thing, I don't know about the South side, like the more popular one, but on the North side, not, not right at the summit, but just below the summit, you can look down and see camp three, camp two, camp one, advanced base camp. Like, and you're just like, Oh my God, I can't believe I covered that. Like, I can't believe I walked here. Mm -hmm. And it's like, Oh my God. It like blow that, like that blows your mind, you know, like. I carried myself here. Like, I can't believe that. Like, and then you're like, oh, and now I have to walk down it. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> reality hits and you're like, oh. Is but, it one of those things where if you trip, you're just going to fall 17,000 feet? I made an effort to make no mistake that I would be in a situation where that would even be a consideration. Like, I, every foot was placed strategically. Okay. You are, there are ropes like, um, now I'm forgetting what they're called. Um, fixed lines. Um, there are fixed lines throughout the route, basically from ad, almost like advanced base camp to the summit and back down. Um, but you're like, you're sharing them with other climbers and the anchors, which is what um, attaches the rope to the mountain. You, do, I don't really have much... I don't have much confidence in how well placed those are. There have to be hundreds of anchors. They're every, I don't know, like every, sometimes like three to 10, 12 feet. Mm -hmm. So they're doing hun like the, the Sherpa who fixed the lines are installing hundreds of anchors. Like to put my life into any one of those anchors, like is not something I would want to do. Yeah. So, but what happens theoretically, if you fell off this thing the right way, could you fall 10,000 feet? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. I thought you were going to say, oh, no way in hell. Oh, that, that's pretty scary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I thought that was a leading question. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> okay. So it's, it's exactly as horrific as you'd imagine it be. Yes. But it's not like I... Like I had studied to put myself in that situation. It wasn't like I like it, I had like put myself in in like I had escalated and put myself in similar situations over time. And then I like mentally like watched a lot of like documentaries and read a lot of stuff like and like mentally prepared myself for that. Mm -hmm. Like and, mentally and like physically, like I just had done so many prior climbs that like I knew how. Everest was the most, um, you couldn't have any sloppy footwork. Like you had to have perfect execution in your, I had to have perfect execution in my footwork. Okay. Um, and, and that is the hardest part about going down because, well, I know we haven't gotten there yet, but going down, you have to like focus so much on placing your feet in the right spot and like kind of like testing your step before you put weight on it. It's exhausting. So once you get from advanced base camp and you, it, you're you spending that week to get up to the summit, you, there are, you're reaching four more camps along the way? Camp one, camp two, camp three, three more. And what were they like? Were they... Progressively I assume th desolate. those were to I, totally desolate is what I would imagine. Like, not I don't know if desolate's the word. Like, progressively worse and worse and worse um are you getting like, more remember... and more scared as you're going up so is is each one where you sort of like actually you know we had bad weather at camp two so i was scared going into camp one i had been to before mm. so you're like okay like i know what i'm getting into i know what i'm heading to um the climb from camp one to camp two you can see it like from when I'm standing at camp one, I can look up and see camp two. So you sort of, it's a long climb. It's probably the longest distance between any of the camps. Um, but you can sort of see where you're heading to. Mm -hmm. um, 
but we had bad weather going into camp too. And it was really windy and I was definitely scared. Um, it felt like it, very extreme. Um, I think we had, this was all in kilometers, 70 kilometer per mile, mile, 70 kilometer per hour winds, which I think is like 50, um, 50 mile per hour winds. And as a result, like first my tent was like on a big slope. So it felt like my, the tent, the anchors of the tent were like, like, I'm like, what if this tent slides off the mountain, you know? And I'm like, I didn't set it up. So like, they're not my anchors. So like, I have to like trust that like whoever set it up was like very aware of this risk. But I felt like my feet were like pushing at the bottom of the tent all like the whole time. And then the other part, like my weight was at the bottom of the tent, like holding me in. Um, And then the other part was like the wind was so loud. It was just like flapping the tent the whole time. It was too loud to sleep. Um, And it just felt like epic, not in a good way. Did you feel like I'm really high and it's dangerous to be going any higher? Yes. So each camp is sort of like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm this high. Because of the weather. When we, when like it was time to move in the morning, the weather was calm again. And we were, it was like, sort of like, yeah, how sustainable is that? But it was, it was sustainable. The weather reports were good, but it was like, I don't want to do that again. I don't want to do what we did last night again. See, to me, it sounds a little bit like a haunted house or something where you're on you're on the first floor and you're going to go up a bunch more floors and you know, it's going to get, there's something more, more horrifying each floor up. I was more I mean, it's scared more and more camp dangerous. Two than camp three. Okay. Camp three, we got there and it was gorgeous. And you're like, I'm at the highest camp in the world. And you're sort of like, we're doing it. Like, I think yeah. this is going to work. Like, okay. Know? That's cool. But, yeah, and, you you're aren't, like, and you aren't thinking you're like, gonna it's going to be, it's more difficult to get down if someone gets hurt or something bad happens from here than it is from camp two or camp one. I guess, you think, um, yeah, I guess I was, no, I wasn't really thinking that. Okay. You were just excited. I was excited. Yeah. And I'm like, I think we're going to do this. Like, I think I'm, I was like, I think I'm going to summit Everest. Wow. Oh, interesting. Like, I so, can't believe that. I can't believe like things all lined up. That's cool. So you're at camp four from camp four. Camp that's three, where you camp three. Camp okay. Three but is the last camp. Okay. That's the last camp. And, and so you're there and you're going to make your summit push. Yeah. What was that like? Okay. That you're like, you, you're like ex- all excited. You go to bed excited or you go to bed. It's like 5 PM and we're going to start the summit push at 10 PM. So it's like, you go to bed, you know, but like, mm-hmm. um, there's no expectation that you can sleep because apparently it's too high to actually fall asleep. Um, but I can hear my Sherpa partner like snoring in the next tent. So like Sherpa have a whole new, like, like they have a whole different physiology. Like what's not possible for us is definitely possible for them. I'm like, you know, he's, he's summited multiple, I think he summited like eight times before. So he's like, you know, old hat, like got this. <laughs> God yeah, style. although although even that is not really that many in the grand scheme of things. Our lead our lead Sherpa had summited twenty two times. Okay, that's, that's like not. he was tied for the he didn't have the most he had the second most and there were like three or four Sherpa that he was tied with for the second most and and he knows them all because they've been climbing together since they were you know they were they were porters together when they were like teenagers or something. Okay. Um. Typically, you can only do like one summit a year. He actually did two that year, but that's um, very, very few people have ever done two summits in a year. Um, so yeah, and then it, you know, it, it gets dark and you're trying to eat, but like you have no appetite, but you know you have to eat. And then, um, well, I remember I, there was this like the, the Americans I could hear again, and they're like having this pep talk over the radio. And I remember thinking like the, the German assimilated side of me was like, Oh, they're so loud. Americans are so loud. Like they're so annoying. But then I'm like, Oh, I wish I was in on that pep talk. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I wish, I wish I could participate, but I, so I just listened. Um, and, uh, the wait, turning they, point did, for me, wait, didn't they, they say a, something about diapers? Yeah, they made or... a joke that like, I was like, 
the like lead guide for them said something like a, made a reference to like our climbers don't wear diapers on the summit like I guess like you got this or like don't be scared but I was like wait I hadn't really thought about like that end of the spectrum <laughs> um like is that you know like because you hear about like like I feel like in the 90s this was more of a thing like people defecating themselves like running marathons or something and I'm like I know what we're about to do is like among the most phys- physically arduous things you could do and I'm like is that a concern? Like, is my, and then, and then after the whole time after that, I felt like my stomach was just going to like drop out of my body. And I had not had major, I had one instance of stomach issues at base camp, but I had not had major stomach issues the entire time. And I was like, Oh my. And then in, it just like feeds on itself, the, the fear. But, um, you know, I had made it that far. So like quote easily that, like you couldn't turn around. I, I couldn't be like, I'm good. Like, I'm just going to go, this is good enough. This is high enough for me. I'm going to just go down from here. You guys go up ahead. I'll, I'll catch you down at the bottom. Cause it's like, you're not having, I don't think they would have even allowed me to. They would have been like, what, what are you talking about? Like, you're being fine. Like, you're just scared. Like it's the whole thing of like, don't just, you can't, your excuse can't just be, I'm scared. You have to have a little more of a reason. Um, yeah, you got to fake an injury or something. Yeah. And I wasn't about to do that. Um, and then I kept telling myself, like, I'm getting dressed at 10 PM to get out of the tent, to start climbing up. And I see a little trail of headlights up ahead of me. And I'm like, okay, like, you know, you've been fine so far. Like you can always, you can start. And if you need to turn around, you just turn around. Like, that's all you like, that's the best you can do. And like, if anybody has a problem with that, they can come up here and try to climb this thing and do it themselves. Like if anybody back at home is like, Oh, you didn't really summit. Then I'm like, you try. Like, you know, I I had like a major chip on my shoulder because I was like paranoid. I was going to need that excuse, you know? And, um, and we just started moving up the mountain and like, I was again, like, I think I told you about the footwork. Like I was like crisp and intentional and my movements were like, I felt like a, like a train, like I was going at like a really consistent pace and like people couldn't really keep up with me. And so I was like passing the people whose headlights I saw. Um, And my team ended up being like the first people um, on the summit, like among the first, there were a couple people ahead of us, but among the first people on the summit that day and my entire team summited, which is a big deal. Like that's usually there's somebody that has to turn around at some point in this two month journey. Um, but my, you know, small ultra marathon running team, like everybody summited and everybody was feeling good and didn't have any injuries or anything like that. Um, Where does the death zone start or whatever, what's it called? There? Just below camp three. So you're sleeping in it at camp three. Oh, really? So do you need oxygen there? Oh yeah. Yeah. I turned on the oxygen, like, sometime after maybe I can't remember if it was like between camp one and camp two or at camp two. I think it was between camp one and camp two. And so you're you're sleeping on oxygen. Yeah. Okay. And so then, so just returning to your down a little bit lower because like your breath is, you're trying to returning, returning to the summit push. You're so you, you guys make it up there. You're starting at 10 PM. That's got to be kind of otherworldly summoning the mountain in darkness. Yes. I had most of my summits have been in darkness though. So that's like, it, that's how um, only in, only once did I summit um, like in daylight. So all, almost all mountains you climb starting, it's called an Alpine start. You start at midnight and you typically summit by, you know, sunrise around like five or six or seven in the morning. Um, And that's because most accidents happen on the way down. So you want the most number, most hours of daylight um, for the way down in case an accident happens or in case there's some unforeseen, you know, obstacle that you need extra time to get around. What is the actual summit like? Is it, is it big? No, it's very small. Like how big? Nine feet? Um see uh like i'm trying to think of like a mm, you know like how like in a hotel they have like like a couch and chairs in a little circle 
Mm-hmm. Like a little seating area. Um, yeah. It's about the size of that interior seating area. That's tiny. Yeah, maybe a little. Maybe maybe let's include the couch and chairs. But you don't you don't want to sit on those edges. And, and when you see it, are you are you like holy shit? I'm I'm at the summit of Mount Everest, the highest point on planet Earth. Um. I personally start to think about the going down. Like once I realize I'm going to reach the summit, I have that moment of like, you. I feel like I'm like bursting with like gratitude and euphoria and like awe. And I have that while I'm still walking up. Um, mm-hmm. It was less so with Everest because it was so hard that I just didn't have that much energy for it. Um, but by the time I typically get to the summit, I'm like, all right, Time to go down. We got to go down. That's the hard part. Going up is so much easier. Going down is so much harder. Um, and if you, if you're like a fairly experienced climber, everybody knows that. And so I like get to the top and I'm like, Oh, I have to go down already. Like I, I'm dreading going down by the time I'm on the, at the top. It's so funny how, how the thing and the meaning of a thing so rarely line up in real life. <laughs> Right, it's so well, that, that's what's kind of satisfying climbs, about with fiction. Prior climbs they lined up. Okay, but but it's interesting that it did, this is your biggest climb, the biggest feat, and yet it's you're up on the summit of the mountain. You sort of look around. Okay, can you even see anything up there? Oh, are, yeah, are you ba- you're basically cool. in the sky, aren't you? Yeah. Are you above the clouds? Well above the clouds. That's crazy. This day there weren't clouds, but I'm, I've been above the clouds. For thousands of feet, yeah. There, there weren't clouds this day, or nearby there weren't clouds. So when there yeah. are clouds, you can't I'm see anything. I'm at the height anything. of like a jumbo jet. This is the altitude a jumbo jet flies, like if I'm going to California. So you can't see, when there's clouds, you can't see anything. You're just looking at clouds and empty sky. Yeah. And most of my, actually most of my summits before this had been in cloudy or bad weather. So this was like the most beautiful summit I had ever had. Hmm. That's cool. And it's and you're, probably you're... the most beautiful summit I ever will have, you know, like. Right. And you're basically in the atmosphere at that point. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty cool. It is. I, I don't cool. know that you and I have ever discussed this before. That's really cool. <laughs> yeah. It, it's pretty cool because it's like we've, we've all been there on flights. But to walk there, <laughs> it was like, oh, my God. Like, you know, um, yeah, it was it was cool. And uh, somebody had told me, which we should know this because, like, we, again, we do this on flights. But somebody was like, oh, at that altitude, you can see the curvature of the earth. And I remember, like, trying to really examine it. And I was like, I think I'm seeing the curvature of the atmosphere, not the earth. And then I was like, this, why am I, this is a detail, you know. <laughs> So uh, that's interesting. So you, and then you, afterwards you come back down. I, w- yeah, my team was a little bit behind me. I came back down and we wait, I waited, my Sherpa partner and I waited for them on like a little, an area that had more space mm-hmm. that we could kind of like pull over a little bit. So we waited for them. We came back down and then all of us kind of like got together for like a group photo. Um, and just like, you know, throw the arms and axes up and yeah. But- but and now the descent is the most dangerous part. Don't most people die yes. on the descent? Yes, the descent is the most dangerous part. Yeah, your your energy level is lower. Your you know euphoria has worn off. Like you know, it, it, you've been ex- out in the elements for longer. Um, you're more likely to slip. Yeah, there's a lot working against you at the descent. And emotionally, the upside is just gone. It's just yeah. there's well, only I mean, downside. You survive. I'm like. Surviving is the upside, yeah. Yeah, well, it's just avoiding the downside of, of something yes. catastrophic yeah. happening to you. What, what do most people die of climbing Everest? Uh, um, well, nowadays, it's on average about like five people die per year on Everest. And um, it tends to be um, Sherpa who are doing the most dangerous work, like setting the ropes or the routes. Um It also tends to be like professional climbers who are trying to do something unique, um, whether it be very, very, 
I would say 99.9% .9 of climbers climb via these two well-established routes. Um, but professional climbers might try to climb via um, a different route. Um, or they might try to summit in winter, which is also extremely difficult and rare. Um, or they're trying to do it without oxygen or something unique to their, their um, ambition. Um, and then the other one is um, like inexperienced climbers. And that typically is, um, I actually, before going, I did a bunch of research on like the cause of death, which is why I picked the north side because the, the largest reason was like altitude and cold exposure, which I think happens like the year after I climbed Everest was one of the deadliest years in a long time. I think since the 1996 disaster that um, Into Thin Air was written about. Um, and it was because there were a lot of inexperienced climbers on the south side in Nepal um, that were caught in a traffic jam. And that ended up making people, they got, they were out um, on the mountain longer, at altitude longer, and in the cold longer. And so like different injuries started to form related to that. Um, you know, your brain can swell, um, your lungs can swell from the altitude, and then there's a whole cascade of things thereafter. Okay. Especially once your brain swells or like, for example, my lead guide had climbed Everest previously without oxygen, without Sherpa support. And when he was about 300 feet from the summit, he came across um, a snow blind American climber. Snow blind is when if you take on and off your sunglasses, your eyes get exposed to the snow and it, they can get like sun, excuse me, like sunburned almost like blistered and you can't see. Mm -hmm. Um, so you wear, you wear special glasses, glacier glasses that like really encapsulate around your eyes so that no, none of the, um, all the light that gets in is filtered through your glasses. Um, so he was snow blind. So he's like, it, he needed, if somebody wasn't capable or willing to rescue him, like that could have been, that could have been a death. Do they, what, what happens with a lot of the bodies? Don't a lot of the bodies get left on the mountain? Yes. You can't actually, um, you physically can't actually take the bodies down from the mountain. Um, there was a Korean team in, I want to say 1990, I'm sorry, 2008 thereabouts, um, that had a friend who died on Everest and they, in 2008, um, created an expedition that was not to summit, but purely to do a body recovery. Um, and I believe it was, I might be getting some of these numbers wrong, but I believe it was like five or six climbers um, attempted to do this. And they spent three days in the death zone, which is above, let's say 27,000 feet. And they were only able to move the body a couple feet. Um, their ambition was to take it down off the mountain and have a proper, you know, burial. Um, so they were only able to move it a couple feet. And I think thereafter, um, the permitting bodies, either in Nepal or China, basically said, we won't permit you to do that. Um, it's just too dangerous. We can't risk people that are alive to rescue um, a body in those circumstances. Because it's six people, three days, and it, they moved it I, I, like, you know, less than 100 feet. That's crazy. Just because it's so hard to carry all that dead weight. That, I mean, even, I'm guessing even accessing the body was so dangerous. Um, because if somebody falls or, you know, they, they typically like the body gets, it's, it's, it's got, it's frozen like to the ground too. Um, and mm -hmm. so even just accessing wherever it's fallen, um, is very hard. For example, um, uh, there was a thought that the first person to summit um, Everest was not Tenzing Norgay and Sir Edmund Hillary, but was, oh my gosh, I'm forgetting his name right now. This other gentleman, British gentleman, maybe 30 years earlier, 20 years earlier, maybe even more. Um, and they weren't sure if he, they knew he attempted, but they weren't sure if he ever summited. Um, they found his body, but they couldn't find the camera that he had to see if he had taken a photo of himself on the summit. And they searched for this for like almost a hundred years before they found it. Um, and even when they found his body, they couldn't, I don't think they could move it. 
That's crazy. And I actually don't think they've ever found the camera. Wow, that's crazy. So if you died up there, your body would be up there. Yes. So what they do is they, like, so that it's for, like, dignity of the person, so that other climbers and aren't, like, stepping over you for generations to come. They, like, push you off, like, the, the route and, like, try to, like, push you off the mountain or off a cliff or something like that so that you, like, have privacy. But, yeah, <laughs> it's, like, kind of the best you can do. They just pick you up like a piece of luggage. And no, just... you can't. They can't pick you up. They, it's too hard to pick up. You're literally they just push it. And they just push it off. And so it goes, it's off the route. It's, it just falls somewhere, some random place. Yeah. I had read that the route that I was climbing had five bodies along it. Um, I wasn't like in the moment, that's not something I was focusing on or paying attention to, but on the way down, my Sherpa pointed out uh, somebody who is clearly from decades past in like an orange um, snowsuit, like, and it, it felt like, I felt like, I felt like wrong, like looking, you know? And you could see, you could, you could actually see the orange snowsuit. Yeah. Could, could you see the person's face? No. Okay. I knew it was a man. Okay. But you I can mean, see, there's a 90% the... chance it's a man. So it's easier to guess, but I, I could tell it was a man. We can only see the clothing and, yeah. and nothing else. I, no, I saw like the whole body, but I didn't see the face. And I didn't like, you know, I think there was like, I didn't see like hair. Mm. Maybe there was a hat or like so, a balaclava or something. So I'm curious, after you did it, you climbed Everest. You, you've now had several years to reflect on it. What did doing that, did doing that just purge this desire to do it? Or did it give you something else, something more than that? Oh gosh, it did not purge the desire. I came back and like was on a binge like climbing it more and more and more. Um, I came back and I like went to Antarctica like a couple months. I have like a rule where I don't sign up for my next climb until like, you know, three months have passed because I'm still, I'm like high from the prior climb for months afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, but I signed up, I went to Antarctica, climbed the highest peak there. Then I, I switched jobs and I went to um, uh, Ecuador and climbed like, three 20,000 foot volcanoes there. Um, yeah. And then I have, I haven't really climbed much, uh, much afterwards. I did um, um, like Mount Adams um, with some girlfriends. Um, but no, I sort of see it as like a gateway drug or so that like purging that desire. Um, but to your other question, what did it give me? I don't think I fully appreciated that especially as like a girl, a woman, you're always taught about like confidence, confidence, confidence. I don't think I, until after Everest, I don't think I fully appreciated that confidence was something that had to be earned. Um, it's not necessarily just like naturally ingrained in somebody, but like if you've earned it, it doesn't like, I, I feel like I've, I've earned some confidence that will never go away. Mm -hmm. even when I'm feeling most insecure about something totally unrelated to climbing, like in the back of my mind, I'm like, no, you did something really hard. Yeah. It is interesting. It really does have to, to be earned. Too. Yeah. yeah it, it, but it really does. And it's funny how it's like with the self-esteem movement, it's, it, you're trying to get something without earning it and it just doesn't work as a result. Yeah. I'm like, I, it made me like this whole self-esteem movement, like, get kids to do like challenging stuff. And for me, it's challenging physically. Like, but maybe for other people, it's like challenging mentally or like socially or, you know what I mean? But there's something mm -hmm. for me about the, the physicalness. Like, look, I think that everybody has had some sort of form of like suffering in their life that they've had to endure or overcome or experience. I don't come away from like a, a mental suffering feeling like I'm stronger now. I sort of come away being like, I have some scars, but from mm -hmm. something physical, I came away being like, I'm a lot physically and mentally like stronger than I was before. Did that persist or did that go away? No, it still persists. Like I'm just less insecure. I don't know if maybe cause, cause I'm older now, but like 
there was some like little, I, I wouldn't consider myself an insecure person, but like any little tiny twinge of like insecurity, I don't, I can't like, I can't, I like don't have the ability to um, wallow in it anymore. Cause you're like, I did something. I earned something and no one can take I'm that away from me. Yeah. I'm good at something. Oh, and, it, and for me, it was like an experience or a tangible thing. And it's like fairly universally accepted. Well, that's really but it's mostly for me. Like I did something that I didn't think I could do. I thought I could do it. And then when I'm there and I'm doing it, I'm like, oh God, I don't know if I can do this. And I still did it, you know? So are you still seeking things like that? That'll make you kind of permanently more robust, more robust? Or are you sort of like, I've done it. I don't need, I don't need to prove myself. I don't need that anymore. I, I think it's, um, the desire I, Doug and I have talked about that. Doug's my husband. The desire for self-improvement is exhausting. I don't think like this, maybe I'm not trying to climb something right now because I'm like focusing on like my family and my career right now. But the desire for self-improvement is constant. It, I don't think I have the choice. I can't, it, I don't think I could choose to let it go. It's not within my control. You don't feel like you've reached a point where there is no more self-improvement or, or that's just not the thing that moves the needle in life. I don't know how to let it go. I, I maybe, <laughs> maybe that's true, but I just don't know. I don't feel like it's a choice. Right. No, it's, it's yeah, hard. that's it's interesting. It's exhausting. It's not a po- it's not like every positive attribute somebody has also has a downside to it and this is one of mine. It, it's funny as I've gotten older, you know, certainly there's something to self-improvement and there's something to just making yourself more robust and more effective. But as I've gotten older, I've I've kind of seen beyond that where I don't know, I wonder I wonder to what degree it matters past a certain point. It's important to have a certain perspective and have a certain amount of wisdom. But I, I guess I, I, I for me, I personally find that I, I'm not sure self-improvement would take me anywhere. That, that's how I feel. And that might be a minority view, but that it isn't like that for you. No. And like, I'll give you an example of like maybe a way I've grown in a, in the last two years unrelated to climbing, but I feel like I was very much a black and white, right and wrong kind of thinker. Um, and then when I had my son, there were times when I was like seeing how other people were making decisions or like, I'll give the example of like, I had a friend who was breastfeeding and I was breastfeeding also, and I did it for a year and she was doing it for a year but her child wouldn't um, breastfeed from her breast. She had to pump the breast milk and then feed it to him. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, I would never do that. And here I am like a year into this kid's life. And like every three hours I'm pumping and feeding it to him. And I'm like, Oh my God, I did it. Like, you know, Mm -hmm. like, so it, it's a moment. So that's what, in terms of that, it was a self, it was like a self-knowledge moment of like, you really don't know what you're willing to do or you really can't judge what somebody else is willing to do until you find yourself in that circumstance. And so it made me a little less definitive or judgmental of other people's choices and decisions. Mm -hmm. I know that's a small one, but I remember thinking I would never do that. And then I'm like, wait, I kind of fast forward like nine months. I'm like, I'm kind of doing it. Right. I'm I'm doing it because I have to, I'm working, but like I'm still choosing to do a variation of that. And so it made me realize like I I can't really judge other people's actions or decisions. And then like this is also like a small one, but like I read some article about like to retain your muscle mass, like eat like, you know, um as many grams of protein as your body weight in pounds. And so like, I started doing that for a long period of time. It was really hard. Like, yeah, that's it was hard. very hard. And so like, it, but like, why? I don't know why I'm doing these things. Like, they don't really, like, no, do they really matter? Do they yield a lot of result? No, but I need a project. Oh, that I get. That that I totally get. And And I need it to be, like, physical for me. I, I'm curious, have, have your thoughts 
changed about Everest over time? Do you feel differently about it? Um, I'm not, I was more proud, I guess, in the beginning. And now I'm sort of like, uh, because most of my friends have gone on to climb like way cooler stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm like, I'm like jealous, but I also kind of, I'm like, I like what I've been doing lately. Um, I'm very happy for them. So I'm not like jealous in that way. Um, but I'm like, Oh, I wish I was out there. Um, and then I'm sort of like, you know, the farther away it gets, it feels less hard. And so I've like, I've like forgotten how hard it was. So I like have that like desire to like feel something else that's challenging. Mm -hmm. Um, but the client, it's not, it's not like I'm like, Oh, I want to do that. I want to do the Everest equivalent in XYZ hobby. And now I'm like, I want to keep doing the climbing thing because there's like a, I'm, I'm like, I felt like I was good at it at some point. I'm sure I could be good at it again. Okay. Interesting. Well, I think that's a good place to end. Courtney, thanks for, for coming on and, and discussing your experience. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me and the questions. <laughs> This is the third one of these we've tried to do. I, I'm, th <laughs> they're this always is, different too. That's yeah, they're com part. completely <laughs> different. So uh, I'm hoping this one sticks. But but thank you for coming on. This is great. <laughs> thank you.